We all know ChatGPT can help us with a lot of things. But with its ability to not only pretend to be your friend, but actually be your personal sleepless butler that looks up nice restaurants nearby and recommends you items in an online shop, we are getting closer to a new world where AI and humans work hand in hand. But OpenAI, <laughs> more like closed AI, but OpenAI doesn't tell us how they trained ChatGPT to autonomously use these tools. But a paper like Toolformer by MetaAI does, and it's not as difficult as you might think. So let's have a look at how they achieved this soon world dominating sorcery. So, what does it mean to use tools? Using tools means that the large language model learns to decide when to call an API and which input to use. With Toolformer specifically, it can choose to use a calculator, a Q&A system, a search engine, a translation system, and a calendar. But how does a text generating model call an API? How about we reverse engineer their system? This here is a glimpse of the final result. This is what integrating an API call looks like with Toolformer. More specifically, from top to bottom, we have the Q&A, calculator, translation, and search API calls. The highlighted parts are the calls themselves and follow the syntax, select a tool, then input, and result. Now, with GPT-style transformers, we perform next token prediction given an existing context. For instance, when looking at the second example, the input context might be out of 1400 participants, 400 opening bracket, and the model would simply predict the next token or word. Out of 1400 participants, 400 or. We can now predict the next token in an autoregressive fashion. That means we include the last output, in this case OR, to form the new input context. The model now autonomously decides to call the API. It predicts a new special token, and we'll get to the details in a second. But now it chooses which API to use, in this case the calculator, predicts the input word by word, in this case 400 divided by 1400, and receives a response from the API. This API call and its results are added to the input context to then predict the next word of the actual sentence. The model now predicts the next tokens, 29 and percentage symbol and so on. And that is how the final integration of tools works on a higher level. But how specifically does the model call the API? And what is this new special token? We already know that the model predicts a special token whenever it wants to call an API. This token is the API token. We of course also have a closing slash API and also a third new special token, the arrow symbol, which denotes that the input for the API call is complete and the model now expects a response from the API. After predicting this arrow symbol, the decoding process is interrupted. The API is called, both the response and the closing API token are inserted into the context, and the decoding continues. Now, in practice, the opening API, closing API, and arrow tokens are represented by these tokens right here, respectively, which enables the authors to use the language model without modifying its existing vocabulary. But to keep the paper more readable, the authors, and me in this video, will continue to refer to these tokens as opening API, closing API, and arrow token. Okay, the architecture used for Toolformer itself is a 6.7 billion parameter model based on GPT-J. So on that front, the authors have not added any novelty. As commonly done, having pre-trained this model on tons of text data, we now want to fine-tune it on our new custom dataset, including API calls. The interesting question the authors had to answer was, how do you efficiently build a dataset that includes such specific tasks, namely the API calls? There simply is no such dataset out there in the wild, and handcrafting those thousands or millions of examples that include using API calls is extremely expensive and just not scalable. The idea? Automatically generate the dataset using pre-trained large language models. To achieve this goal, the authors rely on a recent concept that involves using large language models with in-context learning. This approach allows them to generate entire datasets from scratch, with the help of just a few human-written examples, demonstrating API call usage. 
Let's have a look at how this is done. In short, we always start with a base fine-tuning dataset C of plain text and a pre-trained model M. Sample a data point, for example a sentence, and automatically inject a useful API call into it. To do so, for each data point in C, we find a place to inject an API call, this will then be step 0. We then sample multiple potential inputs for the API, that is then step 1. Execute the API for each input, that is then step 2. And then filter through the API calls, which is then step 3. But okay, let's have a better look at what all of that actually means. Before getting to sampling API calls, we need to find a fitting place to call an API. Let's sample one sequence X from our dataset C. This example sentence offers 9 slots where we could inject an API call. Step 0 now consists of sampling k of those candidate positions for doing API calls. We select valid candidates by computing for each slot i the probability that the model M selects to start an API call at the position i. That means the probability of predicting the API token. In the end, if this probability is below a threshold tau, this candidate is discarded. Okay. So we now have up to k candidate positions i. Let's call this set large i. For each of those positions in i, we now sample up to m API calls. To have a better overview, let's stick to one of those positions, position 6. To sample multiple API calls, we need to construct a prompt for our large language model by using our input sequence up to position 6 as a prefix. What the authors further did was to prepend this prompt with API-specific instructions, let's call them P of X, that encourage the language model to use the right API. You can here see an example of such a prompt for the question answering tool. So our prompt for sampling API calls now is P of X, Pittsburgh is also known as opening API token. We can now let our model sample m API calls given this input sequence and the closing API token as an end of sequence token. The examples where the model does not generate a closing API token are discarded. But for simplicity, let's again just stick to one example. Okay, we now have up to m ready API calls for each candidate position i. We continue constructing our sequence by now actually executing the API that our model wants to call. When detecting the execute API token, the arrow symbol, the decoding process is interrupted and the API is called with its input. This API call can literally be anything, for example executing a Python script, calling another neural network and so on. You name it. In the end, the response just needs to be a single text sequence. Let's call the response sequence R. Continuing the specific example from before, our prompt grows to the following sequence. Okay, cool. That means we now have up to m complete API calls for each candidate position i. Now comes the tricky part. Which of those API calls are actually useful? First, I kind of lied to you. After calling the API, let's call the API call itself C, and receiving a response R is complete, the original sentence completion task is to be continued. But all tokens belonging to the API call are not actually injected at position R in the middle of the sentence. They are given to M as a prefix Z. This is done for the filtering process specifically, because the model is not yet fine-tuned on any examples containing API calls. Suddenly having them in the middle of the sequence X would simply disrupt the learned patterns that were present in the normal pre-training corpus. But okay, we can now finally define a metric that we will use to evaluate whether including the API call is useful or not. The authors use the weighted cross-entropy loss over the missing tokens. In our example, that would be the tokens the steel city. Now a little math time. Let's define an arbitrary sequence of weights as wi. The weighted cross-entropy loss is now defined as follows. What this simply means is we compute the weighted sum over the prediction probabilities for each of the missing tokens, also taking the logarithm. In other words, we want to maximize the probability of predicting the correct token. 
By the way, if you have any questions or just want to chat about papers and AI, feel free to join our Discord community. But continuing, in our example, the probabilities of predicting the correct tokens would mean the following. First, given our input sequence, starting with a prefix, and then Pittsburgh is also known as, what is the probability of the model predicting the word the? Then appending that token to the input sequence, what is the probability of predicting the word steel? And so on. Okay, cool. We now have a metric that measures the performance. We now want to know if the API call improves this metric, that means decreases the loss, or not. The authors hereby compare two cases. The first case is the just discussed loss, including the API call and its results as a part of the input sequence. Makes sense so far. In the second case, the epsilon simply represents an empty sequence. So the second loss is the minimum of the losses for doing no API call at all and doing an API call but not providing the response. Intuitively, we expect that the model performs better with an API call and its response than an API call with no response or even no API call at all. In this case, the API is useful. To be a bit more formal, we want the addition of the API call with its response to reduce the loss by at least a filtering threshold tau f. You can here for example see two cases for such API calls, where the one we have been looking at so far is useful and the second one is not. Whew, okay, we now know which of those complete API calls are actually useful. We can now finally build our new dataset. So we started with our base dataset C, and for every input text X with an accepted corresponding API call C and its result R at position I, we construct a new sequence X star. Those data points are added on top of the existing ones in C to now construct the new dataset C star. Every input text with potentially multiple useful API calls is included. That means the Pittsburgh example might appear multiple times with different API calls that all were useful. Finally, we have automatically generated our dataset including API calls. Ultimately, this method is agnostic of the base dataset being used. That means you could use it on any of your own. In the two former paper, the entire base dataset C used for generating C star was a subset of the CC net. Now, regarding the actual training, there is not much to say here. Given the new dataset, the GPT-J based transform model is fine-tuned as you would fine-tune every other large language model. Now, those tools two former users can't add items to a shopping cart for you, but the idea is similar. With the tools used in Toolformer, the authors try to approach known limitations with large language models, such as hallucinations, poor arithmetics, and simply stating factually wrong information. Let's have a look if Toolformer actually uses API calls to solve problems and whether those API calls lead to better performance compared to other baseline approaches. The authors compare the performance of the following models. The regular GPT-J model without any fine-tuning, the GPT-J model fine-tuned on C, the dataset without the API calls, we then have Toolformer but with API calls disabled. That means pretty much just GPTJ fine tuned on C star. We then finally have our Toolform model itself, which is GPTJ fine tuned on C star with API calls enabled. We then also compare to the 175 billion parameter GPT 3 model and the 66 billion parameter OPT model. It is notable that the latter two models are 25 and 10 times larger than the other baseline models, respectively. Okay, so for testing the factual accuracy of the model, the authors evaluate the model's performance on a subset of the LAMA benchmark. This benchmark was originally designed to evaluate masked language models, i.e. filling in missing tokens or sequences. So to only process examples in a left-to-right fashion, the authors filter out all examples where the mask token is not the final token. As we can see, Toolformer outperforms the baselines, which all perform fairly similarly. It is not only important that Toolperformer outperforms the other models when having API calls enabled, but that it actually uses the question answering tool for retrieving the required information in almost all cases, namely 98.1%.
For 0.7% it uses a different tool and for 1.2% of all cases it uses no tool at all. When it comes to evaluating tool performers mathematical reasoning abilities, the authors use three math specific data set. As expected, Toolformer again significantly outperforms the other baseline models since it can make use of the calculator. Across all benchmarks, Toolformer decides to ask the calculator for help for 97.9% .9 of all examples. In the end, Toolformer was evaluated in multiple different disciplines on a plethora of different benchmarks. Covering all results would exceed the scope of this video. Nevertheless, let's have a look at one last example of how significant the performance gain is due to the use of tools specifically the Calendar API. With the ability to use tools like the Calendar, our large language model can finally have a sense of time. To investigate the utility of this API, the authors evaluate all models on Templama and a new dataset called Dataset. Very creative naming, right? The first dataset contains questions about facts that change with time. For example, Cristiano Ronaldo plays for blank. The new dataset includes questions containing combinations of random dates or durations. For example, what day of the week was 30 days ago? In the case of the dataset, dataset for obvious reasons, it is critical to know the current date to answer the question. Since only Toolformer is capable of acquiring this information through the use of the calendar API, it again significantly outperforms the other models. Toolformer here made use of the calendar tool for 54.8% of all examples. Nevertheless, the performance gain on Templama cannot be attributed to the calendar tool, which is only used for 0.2% of all examples. Toolformer here mostly relied on the Wikipedia search and question answering tool. Since named entities in Templama are often so specific and rare, it makes sense that knowing the exact date alone would be of little help. Okay, Toolformer is a powerful tool that outperforms other baseline models, including the significantly larger Opt and GPT-3 models in most benchmarks and it does so by autonomously deciding when to use which tool. You now know how such a model can be trained and how such a specific dataset can be automatically generated. Thinking further, this approach of enabling the use of tools not only helps with improving prediction accuracy, but also opens the doors for more interactive tools. Tools that interact with the world we live in, with applications we use in our daily lives such as smart home devices and services such as booking a flight or restaurant table as shown by ChatGPT plugins. I have no idea where we will be in a few years with this rate of improvement, but the 2020s will be marked as one of the most significant decades in human history. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you are into all things AI and working in the field of AI, feel free to join our Discord community to chat with like-minded people and learn from the experiences of others.